you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to take it with me to Mark chapter number 1. Mark number 1. We're continuing a series I've been in over uh, really the past couple of months uh, that I have not given a title. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I have uh, get, been getting a sermon series uh, that, again, I didn't give a title to. If I were to give it a title, I would probably entitle it immediately. And you say, why would you uh, entitle that immediately? Reason being, uh, the word immediately is used in the Gospel of Mark over 40 times. So if that's just your little fun fact for the day, it doesn't cost you anything for that. If you want to give me a little bit of uh, offering, I take cash or check just for that, a little tidbit there. Just kidding. But I haven't given a title, but we are in the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking just to give you a quick recap of the last sermon we were in. I'm not going to give you a recap of the entire series. For the last sermon we had, we looked at this, the subject of defining the gospel message. And in this sermon, I gave you three points. I just said that we noticed the foundation of the gospel, which is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. We saw the, uh, excuse me, the foundation of the gospel. The fulfillment, number two, was the strategic time in which Jesus ministered. And number three was the fundamentals of the gospel, which was to repent and believe in the gospel. So this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, using the unlikely using the unlikely. Mark chapter 1, beginning in the 16th verse. If you please stand in honor and reverence to the reading of God's word, we'll begin in the 16th verse and go down to the 20th. This is what Mark wrote but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. This is, being, this is Jesus. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Verse 17. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway, that's that word immediately, straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway, there's that word again. He called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And may God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you are a lamp. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to hide its words within our heart that we might not sin against you. I pray, Lord, that you just bless us this morning as we open your word, as we continue to study what we just read. I pray that you enlighten our hearts, open our minds, our hearts, be, we would be receptive to what you'd have us to glean from your word this morning. I pray you bless me as your servant. I am a lowly, uh, I try to be humble servant. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, help me to communicate confidently and clearly your word. I pray, Lord, I'd say no more and no less than what you'd have me to say this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to give you a synopsis of what we just read, Jesus, in the last sermon, of course, inaugurated his earthly ministry. He really defined his ministry. If I were to break up what we've read so far, this is the sixth sermon in this series, you could break up Mark this way. So far we've seen the prophecy of Jesus, the first couple of verses. We saw the forerunner to Jesus, which is John the Baptist. We saw the baptism of Jesus. We then we see the uh, temptation of Jesus, the definition of, gospel, of the gospel message, which is the last one we looked at. This week we see really the first dialogue it's not necessarily the first, but this is the first dialogue where Jesus is talking with someone else. Because, of course, we know we saw that um, Jesus spoke to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. But this is where we get to um, Jesus talking with disciples, Jesus talking with people who, whom he would minister to. And so Jesus is calling four disciples. This is the first four of the twelve that we see here. Who are they? Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Who can tell me what they did for a living? They fish. Good job. Y'all saw it in the text. Now, they're fishermen. They fished. Now, Jesus walks in, and little did these lowly fishermen know that this fellow is about to change their life. Now, it's important to notice here, this is not the first time that Jesus has met Simon and Andrew. Because if it were, it would be kind of strange. Imagine you're just doing your job. And this guy comes up and says, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. I think we'd kind of be a little disturbed if some random guy came up that we had never met and said that to us. So there's, there's a pre-knowledge, I guess, the only word that's come to my mind, of 
John, excuse me, Simon and Andrew knowing Jesus. So he'd met them before because Simon and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. And so they had had interaction with Jesus before. They've known of Jesus. They've met Jesus. They've talked with Jesus. But it's not until this encounter that we read here that they commit themselves wholly to following Jesus permanently. Now, what was so enticing to Jesus about Simon, Andrew, James, and John? It's not like fishing exactly, at least you think today, is your most premier competitive career path. You know, you think, now fishing was the number one career path in Galilee because Galilee was a fishing hub because it was right next to the Sea of Galilee. But it's not like that's some really uh, you know, powerful role. It doesn't give you a lot of authority. You're just kind of an everyday fellow. It's a blue-collar job. They weren't the kind of guys nowadays, if they lived in Columbia, they'd be living on Lake Murray, driving a Mercedes-Benz, looking as handsome as Reggie, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but they were just your everyday guys. So I kind of always imagined that they were guys just like me, boat, you know, just everyday fellows doing their job, getting their paycheck, that sort of thing. You know, being a college student, you do get broke. But Jesus going to Simon and Andrew, I'm going to kind of make this parallel here. It's, let's say that we got together as a church that we're going to have a, a, a Bible conference. It's going to be three days, and we're going to have some speakers come. And let's say, uh, these th- I'm just going to list three. Two of them are, are with the Lord now. Let's say we have Adrian Rogers. Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah all agree they're going to come here to New Life Baptist Church and they're going to preach. We think, wow, these are the, the most qualified, these are the most likely candidates we could use for a Bible conference. But then the people, that, the planning people say, no, I think I'd rather have Michael Winter or John Hamill or Stephen Isaac or George Zamora. And we are to choose three out of the, of the four I just mentioned. You know, it, Jesus going to these everyday fellows would be just like that. I tell you this because I want you to understand this very clearly. Jesus, God, makes a habit of calling who culture would look at as unlikely. He has a habit of choosing people that you look at and say they're not qualified. You look throughout the Bible. Abraham and Sarah were very old. They were, Abraham was 100 by the time he had Isaac. Sarah was 90. You know, I'm sure Sarah looked at the, at the Lord and said, you know, God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. You will be the father of many nations, and through your seed, the world shall be blessed. And I bet Sarah was saying, "Mm, I don't know about that. Have you seen Abraham? He ain't exactly getting around too well, and I don't know if he's got the ability anymore uh, for us to have Isaac. And so we saw that Sarah felt that she was unqualified for that. She felt she was unlikely, an unlikely candidate for to bear the child of Abraham, so she says, I've got my own plan, and offered Hagar in exch- in, as an alternative. Abraham and Sarah were old. Moses was a murderer before he fled to the desert. David was a lowly shepherd boy who, who even when, when Samuel comes to the house looking for Saul's replacement, since Saul had displeased God, Jesse didn't even, Jesse, the father of David, didn't even bring David in the house. He brought all of his other sons. Perhaps he thought, mm, David's not it. He, he surely's too young. He surely doesn't know enough for, to, to even be presented to Samuel. Samuel goes through all of Jesse's children and says, nope, you got anybody else? He says, well, I got, I got the youngest one. I got David, the shepherd boy. He's out tending the field. The unlikely candidate who God wanted. But God used a shepherd boy. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Now, that did bear a little bit more prestige, but it wasn't like it was some sort of, uh, you, you were still subjected to service to the king. Nehemiah, and God used Nehemiah, a cupbearer, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Ruth was a foreigner and a slave, whom God used was Boaz. And if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, that's connected in the genealogy. So God used these people who called themselves unqualified and unlikely to serve and fulfill his purpose and plan. God has a habit of using unlikely people for his service. And Simon and Andrew, James and John were just your everyday fellows. But God used these great men to fulfill the gospel and to fulfill the gospel ministry. This morning, I want you to notice with me, and as we get to our outline, five realities of God's call to the unlikely. Five realities 
of God's call to the unlikely. Number one, notice with me that God calls the unlikely to serve. Look at verses 16 and 17. This is what, what Mark writes. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, key in on these four words here, come ye after me. That's a call to serve. Jesus is calling Simon and Andrew as they were casting their net in the sea. They're doing their job. And he says, come ye after me. He wants them to follow him. Likewise, later in this passage, Jesus calls James and John to come as well. Now, James and John have a nickname. If anybody knows, it's called the Sons of Thunder. I think that's just cool. Wouldn't you? I wish that somebody called me and my brother the Sons of Thunder. I just think that'd be, I saw my mother, she's looking at us, she says, oh boy, that was cheesy. And it was, it was, but I think it'd be a little bit too much of an ego boost for me. But, but I thought that was kind of a neat nickname, Sons of Thunder. That's, that's James and John. He likewise called them to do the same thing. Come ye after me. Now, what is Jesus calling them to do? He's calling them to be his disciples, which entails a lifetime of service. This was literally what they did. They spent the rest of their life serving God until their death. Simon, who we also know as Peter. We saw he, he was transformed. He went from being called Simon to Simon Peter to Peter. And just FYI, if you didn't know, that's Simon, Simon, Peter, and Peter are all the same person. It's just God. God has a habit of transforming people by changing names. Abram to Abraham. Saul to Paul. He has a habit. Jacob to Israel. He changes names. Saul, uh, Simon, excuse me, being Peter, became one of the main leaders of the New Testament church, and he served Christ until he was crucified upside down. Andrew served the Lord faithfully until he was crucified in an X-shaped cross known as a saltire is the technical term for that. James served the Lord, and he was beheaded. John is the only one who was not uh, martyred. He wrote five books of the Bible, served the Lord, was banned to Patmos, which is where he wrote Revelation. It's an island uh, out of the Mediterranean Sea. But he died of natural causes. So he was for the only one fortunate enough not to be martyred. But Jesus has called us to service. And I, and I share with you the causes of these disciples' death to share with you one essential key. I want to make something very clear. Following Jesus will come at a cost. It may cost you. Now, in, in American culture right now, it may not cost you your life, but I anticipate it's not a very uh, far future where it will. We're living in a reality where, it, where it, culture deters commitment to Christ. Christ calls us to service, but culture says, that's just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. And they're full of mumbo-jumbo, if you ask me. Culture, the Bible says there are two genders. Genesis 1.27, male and female, I created them. Culture says gender is a fluid concept. So if you feel a different way, you can be a different way. The Bible says that homosexuality is an abomination. The book of Levit Leviticus describes it. Paul talks about it. It's wrong. Male and female in union together, that's God's intention. But culture says that love is love. That's what it says. The Bible says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. But culture says that it's not life until it's born. The Bible says that God made us in his image fashioned in the way he wanted. But culture says that God made a mistake. And then we can pursue gender-altering surgery. Well, it's really not gender-altering. Body-altering surgery to attempt to undo God's design. If you stand against any of this and you serve Jesus Christ, then you will be criticized, belittled, and persecuted. Persecution, I feel like in America, we really don't understand persecution. We really, honestly, people say, well, people, people are being mean to me for my faith you know, at work. It's really hard. It's not really in comparison to the rest of the world. If you look at what the world actually endures, people across the world, they are really enduring persecution. In fact, uh, in the Bible college I go to, one of the churches in the area hosted a missions conference recently. And they had a, a missionary to China who, um, I don't know how in the world they got connected with this fellow. But there was a missionary to China that actually somehow gets into the country. And he's telling me that, or he's telling to this, this conference, and a lot of my friends were telling me how this conference went. They said, he said that there are a plethora of Chinese people being saved. 
There are house churches. There are uh, underground churches. I mean, they are all over the place in China, and China's Christian uh, influence is growing. And Xi Jinping knows all about these, and he's trying his best to persecute them. It's funny, when, persecute, when, when faith costs you death, it seems to grow the most. So we don't really understand persecution the way that Chinese people do or, or uh, people in genuinely persecuted countries are. But persecution still does exist on a minor scale here because you can be criticized, belittled, and uh, persecuted in a small sense here in America. But we are called to service. But what are the, some of the ways we can serve? We can serve in our choir. We can sing and serve instrumentally. We can serve in the nursery. We can serve in child care. We can serve in the sound booth. There are different ways we're called to service. And we can pursue service. If you have any questions, ask me at the service. We can plug you right in. I'd love to see some, uh, some people volunteering in the sound booth. We, of course, forgive me if I didn't come up to you this morning to uh, say hello and to greet you. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. We would love some more sound volunteers. So here's your encouragement this morning. But number one, Jesus calls the unlikely to serve. Number two, Jesus calls the unlikely to instruction. Verse 17 continues and finishes, and it says, And I will make you to become fishers of men. So Jesus here issues one of his most famous lines. Sometimes you'll find this plastered on the wall in a bathroom or plastered in a house or something. I mean, people will, will put this line on mugs, T-shirt, anything. I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, Jesus did not do this immediately. He didn't just automatically make them fishers of men by saying, I'm going to make you become one. They weren't just automatically there. Key in on the words, make you become. This implies that this was a process, that it was going to take time for Jesus to fashion these men into fishers of men. That required Simon, Andrew, James, and John to submit to Jesus' instruction. They had to recognize that they didn't know it all, and they had to submit to the tutelage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of the Christian walk requires that you would be willing to submit to instruction of Christ that's found in God's Word. We don't have Jesus to walk along with us and tell us these things like they were privileged to have, but we have the fully fleshed out, finalized Word of God that is just about the same. It's not audible, but they say, if you want to hear God speak audibly, read His Word aloud. God speaks through His Word. We have to submit ourselves to that instruction. We often don't like the instruction found in God's Word because it contradicts the lusts of the flesh. But part of growing in your Christian walk is being obedient to the instruction found in the Bible. The Ten Commandments, the Great Commission, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. The Great Commission tells us to evangelize. Go, tell people about your faith. The Great Commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. That always a tongue twister for me. And then Jesus also says, in the, and the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're to do. When he calls us to follow him, he's calling us to submit to the discipline of obedience, which requires that you read your Bible daily and pray to him ceaselessly. Number one, Jesus calls the unlikely to serve. Number two, Jesus calls the unlikely to instruction. Notice thirdly, Jesus calls the unlikely to respond. Verse 18 says this, and I'll read that quickly. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Notice that Simon uh, and Andrew straightway forsook their nets and followed him. This just means they immediately forsook their nets. They cast their nets aside and they followed him. They responded eagerly without hesitation, knowing who it was that they were following. God expects the same from us. He expects that eagerness. He expects that immediate obedience. He doesn't want you to say, give me three business days and I'll get back with you. He wants you to submit and be willing to totally follow him. And I guarantee that Simon and Andrew probably had some doubts. They didn't know how things were going to go. They didn't know what the next three years were going to look like. But they submitted anyway. My encouragement to you is this, is to respond to God with eagerness and trust. You don't need to know the outcome. God has not called us to know the outcome. God has just called us to trust Him in the process. You may be going through a life journey. You may be going through a difficult season. 
And if let's parallel it to a car. I drive through the mountains quite often. I mean, I'm driving from Hendersonville, North Carolina, to here four times a week, that, there or back. So I, I know about mountain driving. Mountain has a lot of fog. Let's say your life's journey right now is you're driving through it, and all you can see is the fog in front of you, which doesn't give you a lot of clarity on where you're going. You can see what's in your side view mirrors and what's your, in your rear view mirror as far as the fog will permit you. Life is a lot like that sometimes. You're looking forward, hoping the fog's going to clear, but all you can see is the fog, leaving you a lot of uncertainty, and you're constantly being reminded of what's in the rearview mirror. I tell you this to say this. You've got to learn to trust God. Respond with trust. Don't expect God to just give you all the answers. He will with time, but you cannot immediately have all the answers. Be willing to trust God. And just say, you know, God, I don't know the outcome, but I'm ready for the ride. Take me through it. Give me the strength to endure it. So firstly, Jesus calls the unlikely to serve. Secondly, he calls the unlikely to instruction. Thirdly, he calls the unlikely to respond. Fourthly, Jesus calls the unlikely to prepare. Verse 19 says this, And when he had gone a little further, thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. So Jesus now has two out of twelve with them, and, now, and he, as he's continuing down the road a little bit further to the Sea of Galilee, he comes across the sons of thunder, adding two more to his number. That kind of rhymed, actually. I, I should be a rapper, you know. Just kidding. Uh, but what Christians find them doing is, or excuse me, what Jesus Christ finds them doing is mending their nets. And what's so significant about this? The theologian William Lane, who lived uh, roughly between the 1800s, I believe, wrote, Mark's term here means to properly put in order or to make ready, and so includes cleansing, mending, and folding the nets in preparation for the next evening's fishing. So the idea of them, what they're doing is, Mark's term here, again, means to properly put in order. That means mending is to put in order, to make ready, and so includes clen cleansing, mending, and folding the nets for tomorrow's work. A derivative of this Greek word that's used here for that word mending is also found in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 and I'll read that to you. It says for the perfection, that's that word there, the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So Paul was talking about in Ephesians the equipping of God's people. The mending is to be perfected, is to be worked upon. A call to serve is a call to prepare. One thing that Bryant has, of course he's not here right now, he slipped away. One thing he ingrained in me uh, from the moment I expressed interest in ministry was that a call to preach is a call to prepare. That likewise applies to other areas of ministry. A call to preach is a call to prepare. A call to worship ministry is a call to prepare. A call to children's ministry is a call to prepare. Every area of ministry demands our preparation. We must prepare. We must work to make sure we're giving God our absolute best. If you're a greeter, your preparation is to learn how to be nice. You don't want a sour greeter in the morning, I'm sure. If you're a children's ministry worker, your preparation is to learn how to be kind to children. If you're a volunteer in the audio med video ministry, like Brother Gerald is back there, I, I'm very glad to see Brother Gerald has been helping out a lot recently. And he's, learning, he's preparing by learning the sound equipment. It can be very difficult. Uh, Brother Doug, he's been serving a lot with Brother Stephen, helping out a lot. I'm so thankful to have Doug's smiling face. You know, if I were half as handsome as Doug, I think I'd, I'd be all right. But, uh, but Doug, you know, he, he's also preparing and helping out. We, ha we are called to prepare for his service to give God our best. So number one, Jesus calls the unlikely to serve. He calls the unlikely to instruction. He calls the unlikely to respond, to prepare. But fifth and finally, Jesus calls the unlikely to forfeit. Or look at verse 20. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after them. When I say the word forfeit, it sounds like I'm saying that Jesus is calling the unlikely to throw in the towel. That's not what I mean. That's why I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain that. When I say the word forfeit, I mean that Jesus is calling the unlikely to forfeit everything in pursuit of Christ. 
We see that James and John in this verse just leave in the middle of their work shift. Look at verse 20 again. And immediately he called them, straightway he called them, and they left their father, Ze they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants. So they're out in the boat with Papa and his friends. They're doing their job. And they just leave. So they're doing their work. But usually leaving in the middle of a shift, you know, if we were to do that very same thing, I think we'd probably get fired. But I don't think that was the biggest of James and John's concern. They left what they knew. They left their father. They left their financial security. They left their steady job in a fish-driven economy in Galilee in pursuit of forfeiting everything for Christ. God has called us to leave it all behind in pursuit of him. Luke 9, 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What does it mean to take up your cross? Well, let's first define what your cross is. Dr. Charles Stanley said, he, he, I, I, I was in preparation for this sermon, I was studying some things he wrote. He says, the, it's, your cross is not divorce, it's not financial trouble or children rebelling or the difficulties of your job. He says, he suggests that we overemphasize the phrase, pick up your cross without looking at what comes first, denying himself. The most important part of casting everything aside and in pursuit of Jesus is forfeiting everything that we want, everything we feel like we need in pursuit of God's will. God often will put us in situations that we're uncomfortable with. But forfeiting ourselves to God's will is recognizing no matter where God puts us vocationally or where God puts us relationally, that it's all about what he wants. It's all about his will. God may put us in a job we may not like, but he may be putting us in a situation where he certainly wants us to be in. It's about self-denial, denying yourself, and then picking up your cross in pursuit of Christ. God is calling each of us to something. We're all called to obedience. We're all called to evangelize. We're all called to love. We're not all called to be a pastor or a missionary or anything like that or a preacher. But we are all called to something. Likewise, we are called to serve, to submit to instruction, to respond eagerly, to prepare appropriately, and to forfeit everything. Our sole pursuit in life should be to glorify our risen King. Not only are we called to these things, but I believe each and every soul is called to salvation. There are some that are going to say, and then in the theological realm, they're saying some that, that God only died for some. And I'm not going to get into that sort of uh, nightmare theologically. But I believe that God died for every single soul, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible also says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe God is calling first and foremost before he calls you to service. He's calling you to salvation. The Bible teaches us that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He calls us to salvation because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, God recognized there was a need on earth. And the justice of God would have demanded that he just continue on and that we would live in our sin and that we would die and, and burn in hell for eternity. That's, that's the justice of God. As, as cruel as it sounds, that's the justice of God. But the love and mercy of God said, you know what? I see a need. And I love the old, uh, old song. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live in the flesh, to humiliate himself completely and totally, bear himself on a cross, and die to pay the penalty and the price for your sin. But not only did he die, three days later, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he rose so that he could call you out of darkness into his marvelous light and for salvation. That is how God uses the unlikely, by first calling you to salvation and then calling you to service.